back, we are going to continue our exploration of the space-time algebra and geometric algebra in general using this, uh, this paper by uh, this, these authors. Uh, space-time algebra is a powerful tool for electromagnetism, and I'll remind you that you can grab the paper right here off of the archive. And <clears throat> where are we? Well, let's see. We have done... We have done... By vectors, products with vectors, we've, well, I don't want to cross it out, how disrespectful. We want to, we have done this section, we've done all of these sections, and now we are on section 3.32, reversion and inversion, which are operations that you can apply to uh, these, you can apply these operations to multi-vectors. And they seem like, just to be clear, they seem like they're their own operations, but there's really only two operations, right? There's only space-time multiplication, and I, I should write that as multi-vector M and multi-vector N can be multiplied together using the space-time product. And then there is addition, right, where you can take a multi-vector M and you can add a multi-vector N. And we've talked about both of those things. So reversion and inversion is an operation, and it does apply to multi-vectors, but ultimately these are the two real operations, and everything else is introduced for convenience. And it's very significant because it's important and convenient, but uh, understand that point. So with that in mind, let's uh, review and begin. I'd like to begin with one quick errata from Lesson 9. So this errata goes back to Lesson 9. And a viewer pointed out that uh, I was a little bit uh, quick when I specified that the pseudoscalar basis vector, which is this object here, which we shorten all the way down to 0, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, but we really shorten all the way down to i. When I said, I said there is only one four volume that is the pseudoscalar basis. And to be clear, let me make sure I, I that was imprecise, right? because there's many ways of defining a four volume in any four dimensional space. But what I'm trying to get at is if you to have four basis vectors that are, are orthogonal, so you have some basis set, gamma, mu, right? Then that basis set can be used to create a pseudoscalar. And that pseudoscalar, as we've seen, is always gonna look like zero, one, two, three in the way we write things down. However, if you had a different basis set, say delta mu, right, that would give you uh, delta 0, 1, 2, 3, and that would certainly be a different four volume, depending on the relationship between delta and gamma, which in principle would be, there would be a transformation between the two, so they would be different. So the four volume definitely depends on the basis set you choose, but notice the structure that we write down is actually the same. Now, having said that this is the same, it is still true that we are assuming a certain handedness here and that I could also have chosen my four volume to be 0, 2, 1, 3, which would have, had, uh, which would have been a right-handed or a, a left-handed system. Well, a system whose handedness is opposite, right? These would have opposite handedness. And so that is a choice we have to make. And so in some sense, there are two because the handedness, handedness is real. Handedness is a very important thing. It's not, it's arbitrary for us to choose how we want to establish our basis handedness, which in this case would be opposite to each other, but although we always will go with this handedness in our work, but uh, things that have circulation, though, that circulation is not arbitrary, right? A wedge B is not the same as B wedge A. Likewise, uh, Gamma one two three is not the same as gamma zero. Gamma zero one two three is not the same as gamma zero two three one. So, I guess what I was trying to say when I said there is only one is certainly there is only one dimensionality in in the space time algebra. There is only one dimensionality for lambda four of m one three. Right, that's for sure. That's absolutely true. It's a one dimensional structure. The question is 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 there only one way to choose the basis? Meaning, is there only one way to choose this four volume? And of course, no, there's many ways of choosing the four volume. There's as many ways as you can choose basis, bases, and then 
there's times two of those because you could choose the handedness. But uh, when I said there's only one, what I kind of mean is, is that you're only going to see us write it as zero, as gamma zero, one, two, three for this class. Okay, so thank you for the uh, observation and uh, let's move on. There's not too much need to review because actually the last whole lesson was almost a review. The last reading of the paper was this section about, what did they call it? They called it the bivector product, right? We talked about the bivector product. And we went through this calculation in good detail where what we learned was when you do not have a coordinate system, you can still break things up into the rejection, the uh, projection and rejection parts. A vector can be broken up into projection and rejection and relative to a bivector. And then once you've done that, we've actually worked through these two calculations. And that was kind of fun. And this, uh, this is the thing that we need to memorize a bit. This, this, the, uh, the contraction of the space-time product AF. So remember, AF is the space-time product. And that equals this contraction plus this inflation. And we've basically learned that this contraction piece is this dot product. And that's just really interesting how that works. Um, by the way, in case it's confusing at all, I think it's worth pointing out that this can be replaced by just A dot B, C minus A dot C, B, right? Because A dot B, which is the projection of A on B, well, if I just write A parallel, that is by definition the projection of A on B. So A parallel dot B, these two have got to be the same, right? That, that's why when we did this, when we did this whole thing about you take the projection and rotate it by 19, uh, by 90 degrees in the or in the circulation, the direction of F's circulation, right? We didn't have these parallels there because you don't really need them. Um, the only reason they show up here is because they made this intentional decomposition earlier. So once you've done that, why waste the effort? But it does kind of make it appear, if you're not careful in your reading here, it kind of makes it appear like, oh, I need to figure out what the projection of A is before I can do that, right? And uh, and and you don't have to, right? I guess the way, the way to say it is, um, I guess, let me do a little drawing. So if you look at it this way, you have the vector B, the vector C, and the vector A, right? And the, 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 the wedge, B wedge C, is B wedge C. So the circulation of this goes in this direction like that, right? And the idea is that I take A and I project it onto the plane and I get A parallel. And then A parallel dot B is this projection here, right? It's that little piece right there. But that's really, but that's the same as just taking A and projecting it right on B to begin with, right? That's my point, <clears throat> is that it's not that a, a, a parallel dot B is something you have to calculate, but knowing A parallel is an intermediate step you don't necessarily have to do if you know A and if you know B, and especially if you're in a coordinate system, right? But this is a way of doing it without coordinates, I guess. Anyway, so, so we finished all that, and now we are going to go on to this section called reversion and inversion. So let's begin. Before we continue, we make a brief diversion to define another useful operation on the space-time algebra known as reversion. All right, with my caveat, it's, it is another operation, but, uh, um, but remember, it's all dependent on the space-time product. It reverses the order of all vector products. Whenever you see vector products in this language, you're talking about the space-time product. There's really no other product. So A, B reversion equals BA. You literally just reverse the order of everything in these parentheses. The reverse distributes across general multivector products recursively. So I have a general multivector A, a general multivector B. If I reverse it, I flip B and A, but I also have to reverse B and A individually. And this is 
I love the way they use this word recursively, right? Because that is a very useful word here. So here, for example, I might write out uh, one multivector, and I'm writing it out now in its relative form, right? The form that has basis vectors. And you see I have a blade zero part, a blade one part, a blade two part, and a blade three part. And B is also a general multivector. And it has a blade one, uh, blade zero, blade one, blade two part, blade three part, or uh, blade two part, and blade three part. Now notice I use different notations here. Here I wrote out the space-time product completely, and here I wrote out the uh, in terms of wedges. Here I didn't use the wedges. I well, I probably should. I probably should put the wedges in here. All right. So let me throw the wedges just to be just so this multivector is written one way and this is written another. In this one, I use the notation, just the subscript notation. So just as a reminder, gamma 0, 2 equals gamma 0 times gamma 2. And because of the orthogonality of a gamma 0 and gamma 2, we know that the contraction part is 0, so we only write the inflation part, which is this wedge product. So all of, all of this is a simplification. And I could have done... This could be written gamma 0, 1, this could be written gamma 0, 3, and this could be written gamma 1, 2, 3, right? This one, this one, and that one. The point is, if I take A and multiply it by B, and then I take the reversion, which they like to throw the little uh, symbol on the upper right of this for some reason. I'm not sure if they do that for typographical reasons, if they, if uh, when when there's parentheses, they throw it up here, but when they're talking about the reversion of a single multivector, it seems like they put it on top, uh, at least in this paper. But um, the point is, is A and B are multivectors, and this says we'll reverse them. Okay, well you might be think, oh well, it's B A, but it's B A reverse B and reverse A. So now I have to say, okay, well, if this is B, what's reverse B? Well, it proceeds linearly through B, reversion. So we to reverse B, we reverse each of the pieces, right? And that's the, first, that's the level of recursion. So 5, reversing 5 doesn't change it. Reversing a regular vector doesn't change it because there's nothing to reverse. Reversing a bivector does, in fact, change it. So this bivector reverses to 2, 0, right? But, and reversing this bivector changes it to 3, 1. Reversing this one changes it to 0, 2, 1. Uh, reversing this bivector changes it to gamma, 1, 0. Rever reversing this one is gamma, 0, 3. And reversing this one is gamma three one uh, three two one right three two one. So that's one way. That's one way to look at reversion. We, you, well, it's the only way, right? You you reverse the you reverse the two multivectors products, but you have to recursively reverse each one individually as well, right? So I guess the reversion of a product is the product of the reversions in the reversed order. It's <laughs> a way to say it. But another way to look at it, and the way we eventually will look at it, is instead of doing this, we realize, well, when bivectors reverse, all you do is you change the sign of it. Because gamma 1, 0, this really equals minus gamma, minus gamma 0, 1. Likewise with uh, this one. So you would reverse that sign. And does... The reversion of, of a trivector, does that change the sign? Well, I need to turn it into 3, 2, 1. So I have to move 3 over 1, 2. So there's no sign change. But then I need to move the 1 over once. That is a sign change. So the trivector also changes sign under reversion. So I could just scratch that out. Oops, I'm doing that in red. I could scratch that out and I put a minus sign there. Right. So I can treat, treat reversions as literally reversing these basis vectors, but I tend not to like that because we, when we set up our basis vectors, we choose a basis. So when we write A in a certain basis, we want to stay in that basis all the time. So when we do the reversion 
of a and b, once there's some basis vectors out there, we usually just change the signs and we leave the basis vectors alone, right? So the way to calculate it is, well, reverse the basis vectors, see what the relationship is between the reversed basis vectors and the basis vectors that were unreversed. And if there's a sign swap, if that's all there is, put it up there. And that's all there could be. There can only be a sign swap. That's how this all this stuff works. So uh, you do that recursively, right? Meaning this is the highest level of recursion is switching A and B, but then this is the lower level of recursion, uh, the next layer of recursion, uh, re uh, reversing all of the parts of B and all of the parts of A. And then it terminates, the recursion bottoms out right there. I just, I love recursion and so anyway, but that is how you would do a recursion for two vectors that are expressed in the basis of the Clifford algebra or the space-time algebra. There is an approach to studying geometric algebra totally in terms of matrices. Um, I, I've seen that approach and it is interesting. It's, it's actually kind of fun because things are a little bit more familiar in some ways, but at the same time, I'm pretty good with abstract algebra, so I'm not too worried about it. But if you don't, if you're not good at abstract algebra, that may be a better approach for you. We're not going to indulge it in, in this set of lectures, though. Okay, go, moving on. The reverse inverts itself, meaning the reversion of a reversion is the identity, which makes it an involution on the algebra. Uh, you know, th this is the kind of sentence that kind of, I mean, if you know what an involution is, the sentence makes total sense. But if you had no idea what an involution was, um, you would have to infer the definition, right? An involution is designed as an operation which, when applied twice, does nothing, right? It undoes itself. That's an involution. So clearly this is an involution, right? And any operation tilde that behaved like this would be an involution. The reverse is also summarized in Table 4 for reference. Well, let's look at Table 4. And I guess this is, this is what they mean right here. Um, notice that they split up into two parts, right? If you have the vector product, the product of two vectors, because remember, little Roman lowercase a and b are vectors. So if you have the product of two vectors and you do a reversion, you just swap the order of the vectors. The reason is, is you can't reverse an individual vector, so there's no recursion here. This is the bottom level of any recursion. But for general multivectors, you have to remember this recursive step. So you reverse the order of the multivectors, but each multivector must go through its own uh, reversion. So this is the recursive thing when you deal with general multivectors. This is the bottom of the recursion, or no recursion of at all, if that's what you're dealing with. Uh, so this is what they refer to in Table 4. So reading on, the reverse of a bivector is its negation. So the reversion of a bivector is minus f, and that's, obvi that's obvious from gamma mu nu equals minus gamma nu mu, right? That's pretty straightforward. which can also be seen by splitting each basis element of f into its orthogonal factors. Oops, see, they did it right there. Gamma mu nu equals gamma mu time, space-time product gamma nu, which equals the wedge product. Again, I want to emphasize, this is so important you understand this notation, right? This has got to be clear as a bell. This is a space-time product. This is a wedge product. That's not true in general, that a space-time product equals a wedge product. It's true when you've chosen an orthonormal basis, right? Or I, I guess an orthogonal basis. It doesn't necessarily have to be normal, but orthonormal, but these are orthonormal. It happens in our case, of course, but uh, it's because that contraction part is zero um, when mu does not equal nu. When mu and nu are in fact the same, and they don't stipulate that here, but they probably, you know, for complete clarity, they probably should at this point, in the paper, you should know this. Um, if mu and nu are the same, then this is zero, and the only thing that exists is the contraction. Um, the reversion of the factors then flips the wedge product. So reversion of mu nu is, 
is nu mu, which is the reverse of the, we of the wedge, which obviously, by the very nature of the wedge product, changes the sign. And then the notation of this last step is notational compression, right? Where you're compressing this wedge product back into this nice tight notation. Uh, it flips the wedge product, which results in a negation. Each grade of the general multivector can be reversed in an analogous way. So the reversion of a general multivector, which if a general multivector, I guess they didn't write that down here, but the general multivector M itself was alpha plus V plus capital bold F plus uh, capital fracture T plus beta I. So that's what M is. So if you do the reversion of M, right, alpha doesn't change, right? Alpha stays alpha. Vec the vector stays the vector. The bivector changes sign. The trivector changes sign. But the quad vector, the pseudoscalars, they don't change sign. So the only two things that change sign when you do a reversion on M is its grade two and grade three components, which is kind of interesting, right? Grade two, grade three change, but the others don't. So there's these little anti, these, these little non-symmetrical behaviors inside the geometric algebra that really do all of the crazy bookkeeping for us, which is really fun to sort of flush out. Uh, notably, the pseudoscalar reverses to itself. So the reversion of I is actually I. Now, that's the, the reason this is important to see is because gamma, well, gamma 0, 1, 2, 3, right? You just, by just exchanging the positions and tr turning it into gamma 3, 2, 1, 0, you realize there's an even number of exchanges to do this. The permutation that goes from 0, 1, 2, 3 to 3, 2, 1, 0, it's an even permutation. And so, so the way that's written is S, G, the sign of the permutation uh, equals 1, right? So the sign of the permutation to take you from there to there is equal to 1. Therefore, it's the same thing, right? The order doesn't matter up to this sign, right? It, it only has to do with the sign of the permutation between the subscripts there. So I reversion equals I, right? And we read on. As a useful application of the reversion, the product of a pure K blade M, uh, which is the kth portion of the, the multivector M, the kth, the k the k grade component of the multivector M, the product of a pure K blade M with its reverse M reverse produces a scalar. So this sentence here, I, I just want to emphasize, notice they drop in this word pure all of a sudden. Uh, I don't think I saw the word pure appear in this paper earlier. So I am going to presume that by pure they mean simple, which is probably the more standard language, which is interesting because that's what a K-blade is supposed to be in the broader language. So saying a pure K-blade, if pure means simple, which I'm pretty sure it does, that's redundant, right? A pure K-blade is like... Um, uh, it, it was just redundant. So, but by cause, because they're using this non-standard use of the word uh, K-blade, they're, they're using K-blade to refer to the K-grade, which, which may or may not be simple. They're now saying, oh, the simple K-blade. So where it should be just K-blade. I'm just pointing that out just only to emphasize that if you read other papers out there with this language in it, uh, just to be a little careful that this language is still not firmly established out there in academia yet, or in the academic field of, of geometric algebra quite yet. I, I think it's pretty close, though. Uh, well, from the papers I've read, there's, there's more notational issues than language issues. Let's put it that way. As an example, for... M equals gamma one two three. See, notice that's a that's a simple uh, a simple multivector, right? Uh, 
for, for m equals gamma 1, 2, 3, we have m reversed times m equals gamma 3, 2, 1 times gamma 1, 2, 3, which, now, if you look how convenient this is, right, when you do this reversal, the gammas are right next to each other, and that's what they're trying to show here. But the notation kind of makes it a little bit obscure in this case, because it's gamma 3, gamma 2, gamma 1, and then the reverse of that is gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. So you've already done the exchange, and uh, now you just pair things up. And every time you do a pairing, you get uh, a square of something. So you're going to get gamma 1 squared, then you're going to get gamma 2 squared, and then you're going to get gamma 3 squared, right? And if you're in the Euclidean metric, this is always going to be 1, right? But in our metric, it could sometimes be minus 1 because, well, if you had a... Well, in, in this case, it would be minus 1 because each of these squares to minus 1 in the uh, convention we're using, right? The, the other convention would be gamma 0 would square to minus 1, and these three would square to 1. But anyway, in this case... So in, in our case, this actually ends up being minus 1, which is what they show here. Gamma 1 squared, gamma 2 squared and gamma 3 squared. This minus sign comes from gamma 1 squared, right? The fact that the minus sign is missing here comes from gamma 2 squared, canceling with that minus sign. And then what's left is gamma 3 squared, which actually equals negative 1, right? So that is... Um, uh, that is... So th this, this, uh, reverse, this reverse square, this, a square would be just m times m. But the reversed square is m times m reversed, right? Or the other way around, uh, m reversed times m. So, uh, so what, have we, what have we got? So as an example, they did the example, the resulting positive magnitude, so of the magnitude of m squared is defined, right? Here's that is defined as, right? So if I'm going to ask, well, what's the magnitude of a multivector? The magnitude of the multivector we have now defining as equaling the absolute value of the reversed square, right? The absolute value of the reverse square. That's the magnitude. So even in our case where the magnitude of this, the, the reverse square of that equals negative 1, the magnitude still equals 1. So the definition of the... Of the uh, of the squared magnitude, I should say. The definition of the squared magnitude, whoop, let me make sure I get that right. The definition of the squared magnitude is, is defined as the absolute value of the reversed, the reversion square, uh, right? So uh, it is a product of the magnitudes of the factors of M, while the sign, all right, so the sign which they give as epsilon sub m, is, and now i got to erase some of this stuff here, the sign is given as the reverse square, not the magnitude, the, not the absolute value of the ver reverse square, but the reversed square itself, divided by the magnitude of the vector. All right, so the sign of a multivector m is equal to the uh, the reversed square divided by the magnitude of the reversed squared, or the absolute value of the reversed square, right? So, and that just gives you a sign. And in this case, it, it's either plus one or minus one. Now, eventually, we'll, we'll see that this guy here doesn't have to be stuck at plus one or minus one. It turns out that this, and this is called the signature, right? The signature of, of, uh, of, of, wait, I said MM. It should be MM here everywhere, right? The MM. Sorry, this should be reverse and reversion of M times M. We're talking about just a single vec uh, multivector here. So every multivector can have a signature, but it turns out the signature does not have to be plus or minus one. It turns out the signature can actually have, uh, other values, and we'll talk about that, I think, a little bit later. Um, okay, so this is a very convenient and useful thing, and hence the reverse square of a pure K-blade 
right? The reverse square of a pure K blade. Oh, I just did this, right? It's the signature times this magnitude. I mean, it's, this is almost sort of silly math here. I mean, if you really broke this thing down, right? The signature is M reverse M divided by M reverse M, right? That's, that's how you calculate the signature. And then the magnitude squared is M reversed M magnitude, right? So, so this whole thing here is just so you can cancel the obvious, right? But by rewriting in this way and then regrouping things so that this group here is the signature of M and then this group here is the magnitude of M squared, the squared magnitude of M. So by doing that, you recover this formula, right? So th this is not a very complicated formula. But this produces the notion of a pseudonorm for M. So the idea now is a, a norm should always be positive. Pseudonorm can clearly be negative, right? And the net signature of the, all of the sign is, is buried in this epsilon term. And uh, the norm itself is always positive. And exact anality with the definition for vectors. Fair enough. It follows that if the magnitude of m squared is not equal to zero, then you can create the inverse of a multivector, right? Let me give you an example, by the way, of, um, of a situation where, where the magnitude of m actually is zero. So here's an example of a vector whose magnitude is zero, right? The magnitude, if the multivector is gamma zero plus gamma three, the magnitude squared is m reversed m. Oops, I'm, I should say the, uh, it's the absolute value of m reversed m, right? And, well, m is gamma zero plus gamma three. m reversed is gamma zero plus gamma three reversion. But we already know that the reversions of a vector is just the same vector. So this actually goes away because it's a vector. And then you just multiply this out linearly and you get gamma zero squared, gamma zero, gamma three, gamma three, gamma zero, gamma three squared, where these are space-time products. All of these are space-time products. But gamma zero three, which is a known bivector because of the orthogonality of the gamma, of the gamma vectors, the gamma basis vectors, is obviously this is the opposite of this. These two cancel, right? These two clearly have to cancel because gamma zero three equals minus gamma three zero. So gamma zero squared is one, but gamma three squared is minus one. So you add those together and you get zero. The hardest equation in our work. <laughs> one plus minus one equals zero. So the magnitude of M obviously, is zero. And you can't even define a signature because to define a signature, remember, we have to divide by this number. And you can't divide by zero. So uh, there's just an example of a, of a vector with a magnitude of zero. Obviously, this could have been a vector with a, ma uh, a negative magnitude, right? If this had been plus gamma two, right, there would have been some leftover terms uh, well, if, let's say it was just like this, right? Then it would have been minus one plus minus one, and it would have had a, uh, and it would have had a squared magnitude of uh, of absolute value of minus two, right? Okay, so uh, there's there, there's an example just to clarify that part of the of the paragraph. And this last part is, is kind of interesting. It basically says, when does a multivector have an inverse? Well, as long as this thing here isn't zero, then clearly if I want to write M, whoops, uh, M, M inverse equals, I better get the real number one out of this. So now this is going to be M times M m reversion over m reversion m, which 
MM reversion, we know that that is equal to the, uh, it equal to, hold on, it's equal to epsilon M magnitude M squared, and down below it's epsilon M over magnitude M squared, which equals one. Right, I'm using this formula here, uh, down here. So multivectors have inverses, and that is something special about the geometric algebra, right? Vector spaces, you know, generally uh, uh, algebras don't necessarily have inverses because unless real numbers are somehow built into the algebra, and in this case, we've expanded our algebra to include real numbers so we can actually create this notion of an inverse, which I guess is, uh, it's very important, or so I'm told. Okay, so we've finished section 3.3. .3. And I think we'll stop there for today because uh, shorter than normal, but I would like to try to keep the lessons definitely under an hour, <laughs> but an hour is actually asking a lot from the viewership. But, you know, it's the way, it's my method. <laughs> but um, this is a little bit shorter. This, rev uh, this section was titled Reversion and Inversion, but clearly, reversion was the hard concept. Once you have reversion down, this inversion is just a trivial definition. Oh, by the way, it is a definition, right? It's The invert is literally defined to be this thing. And clearly, you combine these two, and it's the inversion is literally obvious, right, as I just showed. So our next lesson is actually a um, fun section. It'll be 3.4. Uh, reciprocal bases, components, and tensors. Here we actually make a little bit of contact with the notion of uh, tensors, which don't really live in the geometric algebra in the way... Obviously, geometric algebra can do everything that the tensor uh, mathematics we learned can do. That's an important point. But tensors don't, strictly speaking, live inside the geometric algebra. They're acquired through some other natural process that's in terms of geometric objects. Tensors are hard to visualize out there in the world. When we study tensor analysis, especially for general relativity, I did a whole lecture series on what is a tensor. And it was a purely abstract, pain-in-the-butt notion of uh, tensors are you know, functions that eat vectors and return real numbers, unless they don't, and in which case they return other tensors, if they only eat a few vectors, or you know, tensors of different rank, and all of that stuff. This material should teach us that tensors are to be understood in space-time algebra in, in a totally different, well, in a geometric way that captures all of that and provides some additional insight. That's what I'm hoping we see here. So we'll begin that study next time.